It's a great honor to open this very exciting conference. So what is special about the human mind? Well, one of the strongest candidates for the distinctively uh, human cognitive capacity is imagination, a capacity to detach ourselves from the here and now, to recollect the future, to anticipate the past, to enter the virtual worlds that are created by artists and by scientists. So I'd ag I agree with the evolutionary anthropologist, Robin Dunbar, that what sets us apart is a life in the mind, the ability to imagine. And with that thought in the back of our minds, you'll understand why I was very intrigued when this referral letter was passed to me now almost two decades ago. You're due, due to see this gentleman in March following an angioplasty, so a, a procedure to dilate the coronary arteries, which has been successful. Following this procedure, he's become aware of the fact that he's now unable to imagine anything. He notes this particularly at night when he's never been a good sleeper and previously used to imagine things to help himself get off to sleep, but now finds that he's unable to do so. Can't picture his children or his grandchildren. Please see and advise. So I'm going to tell you more about MX, uh, the, the patient who was referred on that occasion, uh, in a few moments. But I'll begin by giving you an introduction, a general introduction to the topic of visualization uh, before telling you more about our work on aphantasia and hyperphantasia over the last five years or so. So as a, a way into visualization, let's get you to perform a small exercise. So let's try to visualize a rising sun. Consider carefully the picture that comes before your mind's eye. The sun is rising above the horizon into a hazy sky. The sky clears and surrounds the sun with blueness. Clouds appear, a storm blows up, there are flashes of lightning. And finally, a rainbow appears. Now, many of you, but I'm sure not all, will have experienced visual imagery while I was reading those descriptions. And I'd like you to ask yourselves whether the, the image that appeared, if there was one, was perfectly clear and as vivid as real seeing, or clear and reasonably vivid, or moderately clear and lively, vague and dim, or perhaps there was no image at all. You just knew that you were thinking of the object. Now, if I give this exercise to a random assortment of folk, uh, there's a very wide variation uh, in the scores um, obtained. There'll be a few people at either extreme and the majority, of course, falling uh, in the middle of the distribution. But the majority of people in an unselected population do experience imagery when read descriptions of that kind. And it seems that imagery plays quite an important part in most of our mental lives. So most people, when they recollect episodes from their past, will experience visual imagery as well as imagery in other sense modalities. So for example, hearing the sound of, a, of someone's voice or recollecting a particular scent associated with a, a special occasion. Descriptions, for example, the, kind of the descriptions that are given by novelists often evoke visual imagery. Most people, when they daydream, and most of us daydream quite a bit of the time, experience imagery. Visual imagery constitutes a very important part of the experience of dreaming for most people. And many creative people describe the use of imagery uh, in, the, in their creative process. For example, Einstein famously. Imagery can be very evocative of emotions. It can drive cravings and it can be put to use in therapy. It's very often harnessed in mental practice, for example, by athletes. And in famous work by Adrian Owen, it was used to facilitate communication after brain injury. So he asked folk who appeared to be unconscious in the vegetative state to imagine playing tennis, imagine walking around their houses, and was able to detect corresponding brain activity in a small proportion of his subjects. Work uh, sampling the experience of people at random consistently reports that for most folk, inner seeing or visualization uh, is an important element um, of moment to moment experience. Many studies in fact suggest that it's more prominent than perceptual awareness itself, more prominent than seeing. What is the underlying mechanism of visualization? Well, I'll be saying a little more about this as the talk proceeds. But one important idea is that visualization is akin to a, a form of weak perception. 
weak vision, if you like. And there's one very nice study which uh, illustrates this line of thought rather beautifully. Very simple study. So Leng and Sudvet showed that when people imagine, visualize a sunny sky or a face in sunlight, their pupils constrict slightly. When they visualize a night sky, a cloudy sky, a face in shade, a dark room, their pupils dilate. So the, the response in the brain and the body to visualization is akin to the response in brain and body to seeing, to, to vision itself. Okay, let's come back to MX and let's hear a little about his experience uh, from MX himself. Uh, friend of the uh, just a few weeks after I had my um, angioplasty, mm -hmm. I noticed at night when I went to bed that I couldn't uh, do what I usually did, which was before going to sleep, thinking about my family. Uh, my children, my grandchildren, and picturing them, and uh, they just wouldn't come to mind. And also, um, I used to have a technique to go to sleep, I couldn't get to sleep, and that was to start at 99 and count backwards. But looking at the numbers, either black and white or white and black, and watch them in my mind's eye and click them off, and I never got down to one, I was asleep by then. So that was about three weeks after I'd had the angioplasty. Mm -hmm. Did you find that all visual imagery had disappeared? So were you able to visualize places which you'd visited, for example? No, uh, I couldn't visualize anything. I could remember them, but I couldn't visualize them. Mm -hmm. And you don't think that the, the inability to visualize has had very much impact on your ability to remember? As far as I can see, it hasn't had any effect at all. Mm -hmm. My memory is as good as it was, I think. Even to remember visual details? <laughs> yes, I know that sounds a bit odd. Even to remember visual details, which I can't see, mm -hmm. but I can remember. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You just know? I just know, but I can't see them. And I, I can't explain that. So, we were very intrigued by the case of MX, and as he performed very well on the great majority of neuropsychological tests which we gave him, we eventually performed a brain imaging study in which we asked him to look at famous faces and then to visualize them. And when he was looking, his brain activation looked just like that of controls. So these are brain regions in the bright colors, which are particularly strongly activated by looking at faces. And you'll see that the uh, areas of activation in MX's brain are very similar to the areas of activation in the brains of control participants. And in fact, when we subtracted one from the other, nothing was left. So there was no statistical difference between the activity in his brain and the activity in control participants when they looked at famous faces. But when he tried, to, when he tried to visualize famous faces, he failed to activate those areas in the visual cortices which become active when, uh, when we look at faces, whereas they were more strongly activated in control participants, including these two areas, I hope you can see my arrow, but I'm not sure about that, the fusiform face areas, um, which are particularly uh, active when we, when we look at faces and which help, which play an important part in face recognition. So he, he underactivated those areas in the visual cortex when he visualized, and he overactivated in the lower panel some areas at the front of the brain which are involved in cognitive control and effort. So here was a nice neural correlate for the change in uh, experience which MX described. And I wasn't expecting too much more to come of this work, though I find it very interesting, until Carl Zimmer, who's an excellent American science journalist, picked up the story of the paper we wrote about MX in Discover, which is an American science magazine. Uh, and over the course of the next few years, I was contacted by 21 people, including Tom Ebayer among them, who told me that they were just like MX. They recognized themselves in Carl Zimmer's description but they'd always had been. They'd never been able to visualize. Uh, and in the top panel here, you see their scores on the vividness of visual imagery questionnaire, of which I gave you a part a few minutes ago. Um, and here you see uh, a bell curve showing the distribution of scores um, in, in the, the, the general population. In fact, these were Exeter University undergraduates. Uh, the lowest score in the VBIQ is 
16 over 80, the highest is 8, 80 over 80, and you'll see that our, um, the participants who are getting in touch, the thing that they've, they've never been able to visualize, we're scoring down towards floor on this test, as you'd expect. Now, we decided that this phenomenon, the lifelong absence of a mind's eye, needed a, a catchy term to describe it, because the descriptions given in the literature up till then were far from catchy, things like defective revisualization, um, visual irreminiscence. And so I consulted a friend who had a knowledge of classical languages and philosophy, and he suggested that we borrow Aristotle's term for the mind's eye, phantasia, and tagged an aeon at the end to indicate absence. And that was the birth of aphantasia. So we wrote a paper in 2015 describing this group of 21 subjects um, under the, the term congenital aphantasia. And indeed, these 21 folk told quite a consistent story. Most realized that they were a little bit different to others in early adult life. This often came to light during conversation, often with people they were close to, often conversation which involved reminiscing about past memories. And they would realize during the conversation that other people seemed to be having an experience which was a little different to theirs. Other people did seem to be seeing what they were describing, whereas uh, our participants with aphantasia could not do that. And one quite consistent report was that at a certain point, people with aphantasia would realize that when others spoke of the mind's eye, of seeing things in the mind's eye, um, they were speaking not metaphorically, but literally. And up, up till then, uh, our aphantasic participants had always assumed that this was no more than a metaphor. On the whole, this discovery didn't have a devastating emotional impact. People were more curious than they were dismayed. Um, in about half our participants, all modalities of imagery were, were affected. So this wasn't actually a purely visual phenomenon. Um, half of our participants said that they lacked a mind's ear or a mind's fingertip or a mind's nose. Um, and then more than half, really interestingly, described visual dreaming. So there was a, a hint of a dissociation between imagery in dreams and imagery in wakefulness. People with aphantasia lack imagery in wakefulness, but often possess it in their dreams. Two thirds of the group said that their autobiographical memory was poor. Uh, many of them described um, complementary verbal, analytical, mathematical strengths, but then they were of course all readers of Discover magazine, so they were a rather biased sample. And then we asked one question which gave rather revealing responses. So we asked people to count the number of windows in their apartment or their house um, without walking around to do so in, the, in, their, in their mind, to do so mentally. Uh, everyone was able to do this, but people with aphantasia gave really interesting descriptions. So they were having an experience which was schematic rather than visual. Five windows, I remember them, but I don't see them. My thought is intentional and object orientated, and I consider the windows to be in mind. Or I fly through the house and inspect every room if the idea of a window is present. It's not an image, it's more like understanding the idea of a window being there. I know it's there. So having discovered this interesting phenomenon, we wondered whether uh, we were the first people, pe people to have noticed it. And it turned out, as is often the case, that this was more of a rediscovery than a discovery. So Francis Galton, who was the first person to devise um, a questionnaire to measure the vividness of visual imagery, had noticed in the 1880s that there was a small group of people who seemed to lack a mind's eye, whose powers of visualization were zero, as he put it. And the 1880s was a very fertile decade for imagery research because in the same decade, Kotar, who was a Parisian psychiatrist, um, reported patients who had lost mental vision in the context of psychosis. Uh, and he suspected that, that their loss of mental vision was an important driver of their psychosis and particularly of what has come to be known as Kotar's delusion, the delusion that one no longer exists. In the same decade, Charcot, who's often described as the father of French neurology, described a patient who, a little like MX, abruptly lost his ability to visualize. And there was some other work, though not much, that spoke to the topic. So Bill Ford, an American psychologist, who is himself a wakeful non-imager, as he described himself, had administered a vividness questionnaire to a number of undergraduates, quite a large number of students passing through his department, and reckoned that about 2% of them lacked imagery. And then people studying prosopagnosia, that's inability to recognize faces, had noticed that individuals with prosopagnosia um, often have faint imagery, whereas people studying synesthesia, the merging of the senses, which enables, which means that, for example, you will see the letters of the alphabet in particular colors, often had very vivid imagery. So there was some 
past literature of relevance. And now before I come back to Aphantasia and Hot Fantasia, I'm just going to take you on a little detour through a project which I became involved with, with a, gr a group of an interdisciplinary group of colleagues to study aspects of visual imagery which are relevant to imagery extremes. So John O'Nions is an art historian, Susan Northworth, an artist, Fiona McPherson, a philosopher, Crawford Winlove, a neuroscientist, and Matthew McKissick, an art historian, uh, a cultural historian. And we uh, promised our funders when this little group was set up that we would do three things. We would read everything that had ever been written about imagery in the past and condense it. Um, we would perform a meta-analysis of functional imaging studies of visualization. So we'd find out what was known about what happens in the brain when we visualize, and we would create a register of people with extreme imagery. So let me just tell you a little about the, the prehistory of uh, imagery science. So we thought it was worth looking at this because there is a sense in which the history of a subject is the subject. And we felt that there'd been such a cascade of knowledge about visual imagery from science over the previous two or three decades that, that it was well worthwhile introducing the, the, what the philosophers had thought and written about imagery to this new knowledge, both to see whether there were challenges for neuroscience in what the philosophers had written um, and whether there might be um, some insights uh, for neuroscience in the older literature also. And I think I'm going to, because of the demands of time, I'm going to move fairly rapidly through this and just tell you that we encountered essentially two football teams of great thinkers. So we found as we read that there were imagery enthusiasts who clearly experienced and enjoyed imagery and reckoned that it played a very important role in human thought. But there was a complementary group of thinkers, one might call imagery denigrators, who didn't seem to experience it very much, or if they did, didn't think that it played any uh, very important role in thought. So let me just contrast Plato and Aristotle. Plato wrote, the philosopher uses no object of sense, but only pure ideas moving on through ideas to ideas and ending with ideas. So Plato, of course, thought that um, the actual perceptible world is a mere shadow of reality. And I guess for Plato, images were shadows of shadows. So he didn't think very much of them and he didn't feel that they were very important uh, for philosophers. Whereas Aristotle wrote, the soul in fact never thinks without a phantasma. So we were intrigued by um, the existence of these two very opposed sets of views about imagery. Um, and it echoed what, what has come to be known as the imagery debate. So in the 80s and 90s, two groups of psychologists had a big argument about whether imagery is a distinctive form of thought or not. Um, Xenon Pilishin uh, was an imagery denigrator. He wrote, mental imagery should be understood to consist in abstract mental structures to which we do not have conscious access and which are essentially conceptual and propositional rather than pictorial in nature. Whereas Stephen Coslin, who's a great imagery enthusiast, wrote, imagery relies on representations that depict information, not describe it. And a member of Stephen Coslin's team had the idea that maybe the views of psychologists in the imagery debate were being influenced by their own experience of imagery and he showed indeed in the paper, which is cited at the foot of the page here, that psychologists with vivid imagery tended to be on Coslin's side of the argument, whereas psychologists with less vivid imagery tended to be on Pilishin's side of the argument. So we wondered whether the great philosophers had been influenced in the same way by their own experience of imagery. And Matthew McKissack wrote up this work uh, in a nice paper in Frontiers. And then my colleague Crawford Winlove was responsible for the meta-analysis. So he tried to gather in all the data about what happens in the brain when we visualize and to make some mathematical sense of it. Now this sounds like a very good idea, and indeed I think it was, but when you come to do this work, it's actually quite hard because the, the studies, and there were over 40 of them, differ in a number of ways. So some of them ask people to visualize objects, some of them ask people to visualize spatial arrangements, some of them asked people to imagine uh, transforming a visual image. In work in which one is performing functional imaging, so, so seeing how the brain activates when it's performing a particular task, one always needs a control condition to compare with the condition one's studying. So in this case, we're looking at visualization, but you need a 
comparison condition, and that comparison, comparison condition varied from study to study. So sometimes it would simply be rest. That's actually not a great control condition because we know that when people are resting, they're often visualizing. In some cases, it was perception. In some cases, it was a more active task. In some studies, people had their eyes open when they were visualizing, sometimes closed. Instructions might be given auditorily or visually. People might be asked to retrieve uh, the image of something that they encountered recently or uh, remotely. Um, the control task might or might not involve language. The item to be imagined could be more or less specific. So there were lots of fine-grained differences between studies. But nevertheless, it seemed worthwhile pulling together the data. As I say, there were 40 studies, 464 participants, uh, and Crawford conducted an activation likelihood estimate meta-analysis uh, to try to uh, pinpoint those areas which are consistently activated when we visualize. And here in a, uh, a nice fly-through of the brain, you see those areas. So as you might predict with a complex function like visualization, it's not a single area um, and it's not the whole brain, it's a network of areas. And if we think a little about what's required, what's in, what, what we have to do to visualize, I think this makes sense. So if I ask you now to call to mind an apple, visualize an apple in your mind's eye. Well, first of all, affect has to be appropriate. So you have to be in the right mood to, to do such a task. Language is involved. You have to understand what I ask you to do. Attention and cognitive control are involved. You have to organize your, your mind and your brain to perform this task. You have to adopt a somewhat introspective um, mode of thinking. You have to direct your attention inwardly rather than outwardly. You have to remember what an apple looks like. I think it was an apple I was asking you to realize. Uh, and then you have to, you have to do so. And doing so, we think, involves activating visual areas. So this complex set of psychological functions gets in, involved, and correspondingly, a wide range of brain regions are engaged, as Crawford's meta-analysis suggested. OK, so let's come back to the visual imagery extremes now. Um, to my surprise, the coining of the term aphantasia also clearly struck a chord it was widely reported, and over the years, since 2015, now over 15,000 people have spontaneously been in touch to describe their experience, and we've responded to contacts, um, I hope in, in every case, I'm sure not quite in every case, but, but as often as possible, we've responded in two ways, by asking people to complete a, a vividness questionnaire so that we can measure imagery vividness, and by asking a range of common sense questions, which has proved quite informative. The first and striking response was one of gratitude. So many people have said that it's really great to have some light shone on this um, quirk in, in uh, their psychological nature. The greatest mystery of my life explained. First time I'd heard the word, but I cried when I read it. I feel like my mind has been blown. And then a number of fairly consistent associations have emerged. So if you're... Uh, uh, cast your mind back a little while ago, I told you that people working on prosopagnosia difficulty recognizing faces, and notice that people with prosopagnosia seem to have faint imagery. Um, here's the sort of task that you use when you're studying prosopagnosia. You might ask people to pick out the, the real Barack Obama or the real Princess Kate, or indeed Boris Johnson. Uh, now, in our questionnaire study, uh, in keeping with our expectation, it turned out that people with aphantasia were more likely report poor face recognition than people with hyperphantasia uh, who um, indeed uh, reported difficulty with face recognition less often than controls. So there seems to be a relationship between uh, visual imagery extremes and at least um, subjective report of uh, face recognition performance. And this needs to be studied further. We'd suspected from our initial sample that aphantasia might be associated with some difficulty with autobiographical memory, and indeed that uh, turned out to be the case in our questionnaire study. So here you see that uh, folk with hyperphantasia are more likely than controls to report good autobiographical memory, and people with aphantasia are more likely than controls to report um, bad autobiographical memory. And we have now studied this further um, in some work published this year. And if you look at the top left panel here, you'll see that there's a, a really a reasonably linear relationship such that um, people with uh, aphantasia report substantially fewer details when they describe autobiographical memory than controls who report fewer details than people with hyperphantasia. So that 
uh, relationship has stood the test of time. Anecdotally, people with aphantasia had been reporting um, autistic spectrum disorder, by no means universally, but reports of Asperger's syndrome were cropping up uh, more often than we'd have expected by chance. And this makes some intuitive sense because some deficiency of imagination has historically been linked to autism. And this relationship has been studied further recently by uh, one of our student interns who went off to do a PhD in Sussex, Carla Dance, um, who has confirmed that indeed there is uh, a relationship between aphantasia and autistic spectrum disorder. Another consistent report that we received from folk with aphantasia was that on the whole, they didn't very much enjoy reading fiction, particularly not fiction which was replete with rich visual description. So try this. The figures in this boat were those of a strong man with ragged grizzled hair and a sunburned face and a dark girl of 19 or 20, sufficiently like him to be recognizable as his daughter. The girl rode, pulling a pair of skulls very easily. Most of us, as we read a passage like that, begin to form the beginnings of uh, a visual image as we read. Uh, folk with aphantasia, of course, don't, and that would help to explain why um, such reading is not especially rewarding. As we received contacts, we uh, increasingly felt that folk with aphantasia were reporting that first-degree first relatives were affected more often than we'd expect by chance. Um, it was interesting that an interesting anecdote that Craig Venter, the first person to decode the genome, was in fact one of the first people to contact us after the term aphantasia was coined, reporting that he had long been aware that he was unable to visualize and he'd long attributed some of his scientific prowess to this fact. His mind isn't cluttered uh, with imagery as uh, perhaps um, yours or mine is. Uh, our work uh, with the uh, 2000 folk we reported in the uh, 2020 study suggested that there is a sibling recurrence risk of 9.6. That's to say, if you have aphantasia, uh, your first few relatives are 10 times more likely to have aphantasia than would be expected by chance. So this suggests that there may be some genetic basis for visual imagery extremes, and we're beginning to explore this uh, with the help of the large biobanks, uh, which uh, contain genetic data created over the last decade or so. So I hope there'll be some and genetic news to report over the next few years. The great majority of people who've been in touch have lifelong aphantasia. But a really interesting subgroup of folk had lost imagery, like MX, either for neurological or for psychiatric reasons. So here is someone with a large uh, left parietal cyst. It really is left-sided because MRI scans are back to front. Um, who uh, lost uh, imagery in association with this rather obvious pathology. Here's somebody with a much less obvious pathology, but it's a remarkable story. This lady woke up in the Czech Republic, realized that she'd become unable to visualize. I don't know exactly how. I assume she's one of those folk who uses imagery to help herself get back to sleep and was unable to summon it up. Was very concerned by this. Googled lots of visual imagery, discovered the term aphantasia, drove to the local hospital, said, I have acute aphantasia, I need an MRI scan. Rather surprisingly, the MRI scan was performed and it demonstrated a small, uh, acute, deep infarct, a small stroke. So here is a case of a aphantasia occurring acutely as a result of a stroke. So there are fascinating cases with a neurological basis, which we hope to study further to try to um, pinpoint the, the neurological net, the, the, the neural networks, which are are crucial for visualization. But imagery can also be affected by psychological factors, as was pointed out by a couple of commentators on our original paper. And of course, Kotar in the 1880s uh, had noticed that um, loss of imagery could occur in the context of, of psychosis and of depression. It's been described in the context of depersonalization. And I'm now beginning to see it in a, in a different context. So. Whenever any new disorder or new condition or new phenomenon is described, um, there is a group of suggestible people who imagine that they uh, uh, are suffering from this new phenomenon. So I'm beginning to see um, aphantasia occurring uh, as a, a function phenomenon. Psychiatric and neurological disorder can cause aphantasia, 
it seems that vivid, vivid, visual, visual imagery vividness extremes are also risk factors for um, certain psychiatric conditions. So, for example, uh, hyperphantasia, very vivid imagery, uh, may well be a risk factor for hallucinations in Parkinson's disease, for psychosis, and for intrusive memories in post-traumatic stress disorder. There is much more work to do, I should emphasize, to clarify um, and uh, consolidate um, our understanding of the relationship between imagery extremes and psychiatric disorder, but it's, it's work that really needs to be done. We found that there was an interesting association between lifelong imagery extremes and occupation. So if you have aphantasia, you are rather more likely to work in the more abstract fields of computer and mathematical uh, work, physical science, social science, whereas if you have hyperphantasia, you're rather more likely to work in what have traditionally been regarded as creative industries. But, and this was one of the delightful counterintuitive discoveries of the last few years, aphantasia is absolutely not uh, a barrier to creative work, even in the visual arts, and that did rather surprise us. Here are some examples of work by aphantasic artists. Some of these examples shown in our exhibition of aphantasic and hyperphantasic work uh, in from 2019. Uh, and these are cartoons made by Glenn Keane, who is a very distinguished Disney illustrator. And Glenn Keane, remarkably, is aphantasic. Here he is at work. So aphantasia certainly doesn't prevent creativity, but it may have some influence on the artistic process by which artists create their, their work. And I think that there are some uh, discussion, going to be some discussions later in the meeting um, which will speak to that. I mentioned that in the folk who came to us initially, there seemed to be a dissociation between visual dreaming, which was often preserved, uh, and wakeful imagery, which was absent in aphantasia, and this has held up. So uh, around 60% of our participants with aphantasia dream visually, which I think is fascinating. It is the case that the remainder, or the majority of the remainder, either don't dream visually or don't dream at all, and that's also very interesting. But focusing on the dissociation, the fact that dreaming imagery seems to come apart from wakeful imagery. Um, how can one make sense of that? Well, we've known for a long time that the brain is in a very different neurochemical state during dream sleep to the neurochemical state in wakefulness. So during wakefulness, uh, a range of activating neurotransmitter systems are working at full tilt, whereas in dream sleep, shown at the bottom, REM sleep, um, the majority of those neurotransmitter systems are quiescent, but there is a good deal of cholinergic drive. Acetylcholine is a very and prominent neurotransmitter during REM sleep. So there are different neurochemical conditions in the brain, and there's also different regional brain activation. So a number of regions which are uh, active in uh, the waking brain become inactive in REM sleep, uh, and a number of other areas become particularly active in REM sleep. So actually, it, it isn't neurologically so surprising uh, that imagery uh, might occur in dream sleep, but not in wakefulness. What about the question of whether aphantasia is a visual phenomenon or a polysensory phenomenon. Well, it turns out in our work, as in the work from Joel Pearson's group, which I'm sure, I'm sure he will be telling you about, the majority of people with aphantasia, in fact, have faint imagery across the board, not just uh, in the visual modality, though there are some folk uh, in whom only vision appears to be affected. So Oliver Sacks, the famous neurologist, wonderful writer, uh, was aphantasic visually, but could hear music in his mind's ear. Whereas Blake Ross, the creator of Firefox Mozilla, describes aphantasia across the board and wrote a very entertaining Facebook post uh, on that topic. I've talked mainly about the associations of aphantasia, which has been the main focus of our work up till now. But at least in our hands, hyperphantasia does appear to be associated with synesthesia.
Now, if you were feeling skeptical, you might say, well, Aphantasia seems to come in so many flavors that I wonder whether it's uh, a real phenomenon at all. Well, actually, I would predict that it should come in quite a number of flavors because the network of regions involved in um, Aphantasia is complex. Indeed, the same is true of Hyperphantasia. And one would predict that uh, a complex network could be perturbed in a number of ways, uh, producing a number of distinctive um, uh, forms of extreme imagery. Now, I'm just going to very briefly mention that, because I've spoken mainly about our work up till now, I'm going to briefly mention that work from other laboratories has confirmed uh, that there's a difference between people with um, aphantasia and control participants. Uh, I'm sure Joel Pearson will be telling you about this particular slide later in the meeting, so I won't dwell on it, um, but it uh, reflects the observation that uh, when people with aphantasia read visual descriptions, they fail to form visual images and therefore fail to react emotionally as people with imagery would do. Our 2021 paper uh, found a correlate for the difference between aphantasia and aphantasia in the resting brain. We found that there are stronger connections in the resting brain between frontal areas of the brain involved in cognitive control and visual areas in people with hyperphantasia than in people with aphantasia. Okay, so I'm going to wind up with the observation that this work has attracted a lot of interest. So one of our recent papers has an altmetric score of 917, which is very high. Uh, it means that it's in the top centile of scientific papers for public interest. So uh, it's in the top 1% um, of uh, papers in terms of the amount of press attention and public attention. And I think that reflects the fact that we are fascinated by what goes on in one another's minds. There are some general conclusions that one can draw from the work. And first, it makes the, it highlights the fact that we can represent items in their absence in a wide variety of different ways. And for many of us, imagery is, as Aristotle suggested, uh, a key form of representation, but it's far from being the only one. There are, for example, amodal forms of representation like the, the form used in this mathematical equation, which is regarded by mathematicians as being particularly beautiful, which don't require uh, the uh, evocation of imagery uh, at all. So Aristotle was wrong uh, when he said that the soul never thinks without a phantasma, people with aphantasia get along perfectly well uh, intellectually without employing visual imagery, at least consciously. And as we've seen, aphantasia is no bar to imaginative work, even in the visual arts. So that underlines the distinction between visualization and imagination, which is a much broader capacity, the capacity to to reconceptualize things. So what's the underlying distinction in play here um, between aphantasia and hyperphantasia, between the two visual imagery extremes? Well, when I first began thinking about aphantasia, I wondered whether the, the relevant distinction was the one that's uh, often described as verbal versus visual. So I wondered if people with aphantasia were, were particularly verbal, perhaps. But I've become very doubtful um, about that explanation, not least because it seems that uh, aphantasia is a phenomenon that affects all the senses, not just vision. Uh, and I now think that the, the distinction between aphantasia and hyperphantasia is more likely to reflect the distinction between two different ways of, of thinking, one more abstract, systematic, semantic, the other more experiential, narrative and episodic. So this is very much the work of a team. Um, Michaela Dürer and Sergio de la Sala are my colleagues uh, in the initial description of aphantasia. Uh, I've introduced you to the Eyes Minds team already. Uh, Fraser Milton and John Fulford have been key colleagues in Exeter in our recent work. Uh, and throughout, since 2015, I've relied on a very large and enthusiastic group of student interns who've helped me reply to the 15,000 emails. You can read more about our work on the Eyes Mind website.
uh, and I'm grateful to Susan Allsworth for supplying the beautiful Eyes Mind Project logo. Thanks very much. <laughs>